And hello everybody, welcome to this edition of the New Mexico Motorsports Report here on the ProView Networks. I'm your host, Editor-in-Chief for the RacingExperts.com, Dominic Aragon. And I'm David Swope, host of the New Mexico Motorsports Report on ESPN Radio 1017 The Team. And I'm Brooklyn Green, sideline reporter for the New Mexico Motorsports Report. Well, a lot of racing to get to this weekend. Dave, you had a front row seat. Let's mm -hmm. get started with some of the NASCAR action from this weekend. Kyle Busch played the role of heartbreaker this weekend at Dover International Speedway on Sunday. Chase Elliott had led the most laps in the final stage, but the driver of the number 18 Toyota for Joe Gibbs Racing chased him down as the laps wound down. Bush passed Elliott with two laps to go in the Apache Warrior 400 to secure win number four on the season and his 42nd overall. Chase Elliott was second and Jimmy Johnson was third. Bush enters the second round of the playoffs, seated second overall. We're going to have more on the point situation in a little bit, but quite the race out there and, and just a dominating fashion by Chase Elliott in that last segment, but Kyle Bush is the one who got away with the victory. Well, I tell you, it was... Uh Actually, a fairly boring race. Um, you know, typical Dover. It, typical Dover. Um, not no yellows actually really to speak of, other than the stage, the stages. But uh, but Kyle Busch has been on the other side of that many times at Dover. He's finished second, you know, quite a few times, and actually used Ryan Newman as a pick there to uh, to to get him. But when you look at the lap times, and because I was following the lap times quite a bit um, during the race, what was interesting was how the times fell off. It wasn't that Kyle Busch was necessarily getting faster. His car just didn't fall off as much. And as you watched the clock rolling down, you were wondering, this would be a situation where it would have benefited actually Chase to, for them to have had a yellow flag. Because we almost we almost had a yellow when uh, we had the uh, incident with Hamlin come out. But uh, he was able to get to the bottom of the track and it wasn't an issue. But if there would have been a yellow, fresh tires, Busch's car was always better on a longer run. Which, as if you've been following you know, Kyle Busch this season, and that hasn't always been the case. Typically, it's been a short run car that they put together. But in this case, they were going for the longer run. Um, a perfect sunny sky. It was warm. There was never uh, never an issue with with the weather at all. And with that long run, um, he was coming. But but statistically, when you look at it, it was actually because his times weren't falling off as much as as Chase Elliott's. But what was fascinating was you could hear almost a gasp in the stands when he passed <laughs> because everybody was collectively waiting um, for that victory, um, including there was some shots. I didn't realize that, that Jeff Gordon was there, even though um, uh, our, our correspondent uh, John Haverlin was there and told me that he'd actually interviewed um, uh, Bush earlier. But uh, uh, John was there and actually uh, caught up with some of the excitement after the race. And uh, here's, a, here's a report from John Haverlin. I actually didn't even know anything happened on pit road between Newman and Gordon. I, I was actually walking through the garage. Um, I was actually walking right behind Tony Stewart. Um, and Jeff Gordon was walking towards us. And uh, Stewart and, and Gordon were, they were just standing around talking for a minute or two. And then Ryan Newman started walking, walking by the two of them. And Jeff Gordon uh, went up to him and put his arm around his shoulder. And uh, you may or may not have seen it, but I, I tweeted a picture of it. And NBC picked it up, and NASCAR.com picked it up, and uh, it looks like Gordon was trying to uh, correct the situation with Newman, and it seemed like they were having a friendly chat, and you know everything was rectified. So that was uh, John Haverlin was uh, reporting from the track, and it was funny because when when we got out, the first car that pulled up um, on the on the pit lane uh, before the you know they go to uh, the post race uh, inspections was uh, Ryan Newman, and um, he got out. He was he was exhausted because we'd come down and we were trackside for the last couple of laps. We didn't really know where the points were and whether whether he had made it or not made it. And I can just imagine you know the the heat and you know. Know, the competitiveness and you know, having you know uh, a, a Jeff Gordon is you know not not a not the biggest guy in the world basically going up and talking to the biggest linebacker that we have that basically uh, driving a stock car um, is is pretty amazing of course they bro hugged it out later you know and it was uh, uh, typically it was, it was a non story after that but it was amazing to see the drivers getting out of their cars and how exhausting that race is I mean they call it the monster mile for a reason I mean it, it's like taking a beat 
meeting. I actually caught up with Jimmy Johnson uh, right after the race and asked him how much the conditioning played into it, um, and he said uh, pretty significantly. And of course, I had to had to joke because uh, you know Chase finished ahead of him, so I was like, well, I guess youth plays into that as well. Um, but uh, it was it was a, a good race, and it came down uh, to the end, and it was just it was just experience and and using uh, Newman as a pick that ended up uh, finishing that race. Well, knowing that that race is a concrete surface and knowing how much of a harder harder physically that is on the driver. I do remember some reporters even talking like when Davey Allison was racing and mm -hmm. how they started making laps here. Allison, his neck was just like this most of the race. And when he got out of the car, it hurt to move his, his head back into place. And, yeah. and how he just kind of sit there and kind of had to massage his neck. But it looked like a very physically yeah. demanding track. And those drivers looked like they just had a lot more sweat climbing out of those cars than usual. Well, they did. And you know what, what thing is interesting to me is I, as I you know get to go to more of these different tracks, it's amazing how different each track is, each characteristic in, in you know, basically the, the amount of effort and stuff that it takes getting on and off the track and all the things that are involved. Um, it's, a, it's a very long mile track. I mean, not that it's any bigger than, than Phoenix, but it's just the way you don't have the tunnels. I mean, we took the ramp over and the cars are going right underneath you. I mean, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal venue. And of course, it's in a quaint um, town. It came around the corner and all of a sudden there it is in the trees. Almost like going to, to Bristol. I mean, Bristol is, you know, you, you're, you're just off of the main highway and all of a sudden you come around the corner and there it is. Like and then, Yeah, and then all of a sudden you drive by and you blink and it's such a it's such a small town and, and everybody comes out for it. But uh, if you get a chance to go to the Monster Mile, I, I would definitely uh, recommend. It, it, was, it was fantastic. What's the biggest takeaway from that experience and having that quick trip, which we're going to have more on later, but being at the racetrack Sunday, what was your biggest takeaway? Well, it, it, it's always you, you get more of a feel of really what's going on in, in the media center um, because a lot of times, you know, I mean, we're always talking about, well, who's really got the inside? I mean, who's really doing good? And, and Chase Elliott, um, there was a lot of conversation about, you know, how well he could do. One of the most surprising things to me is what happened with Kevin Harvick. I mean, Kevin Harvick, that track is so fast that um, he went in lug nut, then, you know, got in trouble for you know speeding on on pit road and all of a sudden he's two laps down mm -hmm. so then you start watching him race for the lucky dog and then he, he gets back he gets one lap back and he, he keeps coming back he did he dug all afternoon and only got himself back to 17th that is how difficult this track is. If you have problems and you have problems early, and and I know that they were they were wanting him to stay out, uh, but you know, with, I mean, he could have all of a sudden lost a wheel and been in the wall. So it was one of those things that the driver decided. But he had he had to dig all week, um, uh, it, all race in order to get back. Brad Keselowski at times uh, looked very dominant, and and he comes away with a tenth point, uh, a tenth place victory. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and I, as Hendrick, probably the biggest takeaway was just how good Hendrick you know looked. Um, you know, other than, of course, you know, Casey Kane um, ended up finishing 14th. But uh, you had second, third, and eighth. And it, there was a lot of people that were really hoping that maybe, you know, Dale could get it done there. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, Kyle Busch, the class. Martin Truex, you know, was looked, you know, dominant. Um, and then, you know, comes, you know, finishes fourth. So it was one of those, it was a long day. It was a brutal day. Uh, but it was, it was pretty, it was pretty quick. And I think the, the big turning point for the race is, they're running there in the in the first stage, and the caution comes out for Jeffrey Earnhardt, sliding it down, trying to back the car down, mm -hmm. backs it into the little jersey barrier there, and knocks him over, and they have to bring the red flag out. And, and they're sitting Ricky Stenhouse in fourth place. Yep. Danica Patrick in the top five, David Reagan in the top five. Ricky Stenhouse went on to score seven stage points, and that ultimately made the difference between him advancing mm -hmm. and the RCR camp and the other drivers not. Yeah, that, that, that was a, a, a great call. I mean, that's one of those things where, hey, you know, sometimes, you know, you can, sometimes you can win with that strategy, sometimes you can lose with that strategy. Uh, and he definitely is, is in. And now it's going to be interesting because Talladega is in this round. So he could potentially advance. And so, you know, I, I don't think he's going to make it to, to, you know, to the final four or anything like that. Uh, but, but he's right there. I mean, you know, sometimes you just got to stay in the game to win the game. Sure. And he has Phoenix coming around the corner. Yep. He finished top five there yep. in April he used some similar strategy that Ryan Newman used in that race so mm -hmm. there's there's a lot that could happen here Stenhouse could be the surprise this year to make it all the way to the championship I think he was what? a surprise I didn't expect him to get this far exactly two wins and and sitting that high in points how far do you think he's going to go 
I think he'll be out at Talladega. <laughs> <laughs> one of those tracks yeah. to either win or lose. But we know who won the Saturday Xfinity race, and that was Ryan Blaney at Dover. Team Penske driver led the most laps in the Drive Sober 200. In the last stage of the race, had no cautions, and Blaney led every lap when the green flag was displayed for the final time. This was Blaney's second Xfinity Series win in 2017 and his eighth career win in the series. Highest finishing playoff driver was Justin Allgaier, who finished in second, followed by William Byron in third, and just kind of feeding off the Hendrick Motorsports camp there. They're all affiliated, and Jarrah Motorsports looked really strong this weekend as well with, with three of their four guys in the top ten. Well, in Xfinity, it, it pretty much comes down to um, who's going to win from Jarrah Motorsports. I mean, awfully yeah. strong. Well, once again, we, we don't have a, a regular um, that has won uh, in uh, in the playoffs. Uh, Justin Algar looks you know, really strong, uh, finishing second you know for the second week in a row, uh, looking, uh, looking quite good. Uh, William Byron, it was good to see him kind of get back, um, back to form uh, a little bit because he, he wasn't running um, up his front. But I, I got to tell you, the most amazing thing about that race, though, was post-race. Uh, you know, Ryan Blaney giving the flag, the winning flag, to a fan. I was able to catch up with him after the cup race, and I asked him about that. I said, you know, what, what, you know, what motivated you? What, what were you thinking? Um, and he said, yeah, I was just standing there, and I was looking at the, the kid cheering in the stand, and I saw myself. And I, I remember I remember doing it um, and being in the stands like that. And of course, you know, I mean, watching his dad race um, for years, coming, you know, as basically, you know, growing up as a track rat, um, yeah. he definitely uh, uh, definitely was motivated. But see, that that that's class. I mean, you know, all he's got to do is cut the mullet off, you know, and I think he'd be better because I mean, Eric Jones did cut the mullet and I chase. Mean, and chase. So I got to ask you. Better without the mullet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, I said last time, ladies, love, ladies, ladies don't like the mullet, dude. So, Yeah, we'll have to see how that rolls. And also more racing on Saturday night. Brooklyn, there was some truck racing, some truck Ooh. action. There was another first-time winner in the, uh, the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series, and, but this time it was in Vegas. Ben Rhodes took the lead with seven laps to go in the Vegas 300. Rhodes led off a late charge from Christopher Bell to snag his first win in the truck series. The victory guaranteed Rhodes a spot in the next round of the playoffs. The other first two times winners this season were Kaz Gala in Daytona, at Daytona and Austin Sindrick in Canada. And that's very important for Ben Rhodes because the next elimination race is Talladega and nobody is safe there except the two who are advancing. Absolutely, because I mean it's such a the restrictor play race is such a, a wild card race. I mean we could see actually Kaz Grala have a good run. I think that you know one thing about restrictor play races is it, that dirt track mentality or even a road racing mentality actually um, bodes well for those type of tracks. Um, Austin Sendrick it could get up there. Uh, John Hunter Nemechek. I mean pretty much you know anybody can win at those tracks. Uh, but it'll be neat to see. And of course you'll be in Charlotte um, next week um, and be able to. Uh, uh, to see with the Xfinity, I guess trucks aren't running again until Til Dega. until yeah. Talladega. But it's an so, elimination race. Yep. You're going to see what yeah. kind of what kind of racing are we going to see out there this weekend? Hopefully, some good one. I hope <laughs> it's not a boring race like Dover. But I'm ex I'm so excited. Charlotte's like my dream. Like I've always wanted to go there. It's my dream vacation, and it's happening. And I leave in less than 24 hours. There you go. It doesn't even <laughs> feel like work, right? Nope, not at all. <laughs> you can attest to that too. Working at the racetrack and yeah. those long hours, it's it's a lot of fun being out there. Even even if you're going just in the grandstands and, and going for the race, it's it's a great time. Well, and, and it, you you and I've been to uh, you know several tracks together, and I mean Vegas. You know the first time. I mean I, I thought I'd actually met Kid Rock um, when <laughs> when come to find out. I mean he was he was an impersonator, and then I heard his feelings by. By, uh, by saying he was a fake Kid Rock. He's like, that's so, not cool, bro. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you never really know what, what you're going to wind up, you know, what you're going to wind up in at the track. Um, even, you know, sometimes, of course, you know, it might even be a media center when somebody gets a little uh, gets a little rowdy. Um, but, uh, which, by the way, Chris Knight wasn't there this week, so uh, we didn't we didn't get to um, to actually uh, uh, make good um, on that, but uh, at least Spencer was. So there I, you go. I, I was on my best behavior. There you go. Are we going to have more details about that later? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we have a lot more coming up here on the New Mexico Motorsports Report. We're going to be talking with some guests coming to the studio. We're going to have a little bit more on some tragedy that has struck the NASCAR community this week. And we're also going to find out what happened at ESPN headquarters up in Bristol with ESPN Albuquerque taking over. You're watching the New Mexico Motorsports Report here on the ProView Networks. Hoops NM Basketball Center is coming soon. 
Ten full courts broken into two wings for ultimate basketball and volleyball play. Locker rooms, a lounge area, a pro shop, and a full snack bar will all be a part of a great experience. Convenient parking and access will make the Hoops NM Basketball Center a premier facility for league play and competitive regional tournaments. With over 9,000 square feet, Hoops NM Basketball Center will take court sports play to another level in our community. Courts are regulation high school size with wood floors and seating for approximately 350 per court. Major sponsors and supporters are being assembled now. If you're interested, contact Dan Serrano at 505-249-7994. Send him an email, hoopsnm at aol.com. That's hoopsnm at aol.com. Hoops NM Basketball Center, a premier sports facility serving our community. Welcome back to the New Mexico Motorsports Report here on the Pro V Networks. Brooklyn Green, David Swope, I'm Dominic Aragon. Well, we've had a lot of tragedy this week across our country and tragedy also struck within the motorsports industry. He was a pioneer, he was a throwback to NASCAR's prime. Robert Yates left a mark on the sport as a team owner and an engine builder. Robert Yates' son, Doug, announced on Monday his father had passed away after he'd been battling a long battle with cancer. As a team owner in NASCAR's top series, Robert Yates won the Daytona 500 three times. He won 57 times overall and claimed the championship with driver Dale Jarrett in 1999. He retired as an owner from 2007 and his son Doug took over the team. Other drivers to run for the team over the years include Davey Allison, Ernie Irvin, Ricky Rudd, and Elliot Sadler. Yates was announced as part of the NASCAR Hall of Fame earlier this year and will be inducted as part of the 2018 class. Yates was 74 years old and if you look at the mark, you look at the cars there on the screen. Whenever I think of Robert Yates and I think of that team, I always think of that number 88 car that Dale Jarrett drove. Definitely the prime of that race team through the late 90s. The quality care, Ford, and even Danica Patrick ran that throwback paint scheme to him this year. So the, the sport definitely lost somebody who a lot of value to it. Well, and I think he represented probably as much the old school uh, get out and get it done. Um, they would spend hours on the car trying to make it better and better. And uh, actually, he tells a, a pretty funny story um, about when uh, he went to one of the sponsors and they were really wanting, you know, Dale Earnhardt. And, you know, they were, they were like, we, you know, we, we could win if we had Dale Earnhardt. And he goes, well, what if I got you another Dale? And, and he, Dale Jarrett. And they're like, Dale Jarrett, you know, and so uh, he goes on, he goes, I'll, I'll guarantee you that, you know, well, I'll win with Dale Jarrett. And of course, you know, he put his money where his mouth is, but, but definitely one of those legendary names when it came to engine building and, you know, was, was ahead of his time. I mean, a lot of the rules, and we talk about how thick the rule yeah. book, come out of the fact that they, they had to um, find some ways to control or these, these guys were going to, um, were going to push every envelope. And so it's a big loss. Uh, I'm glad that, you know, uh, he was is alive at least to you know for the induction you know know he's gonna be inducted into the hall of fame um but uh, uh but you know i mean uh, what a loss but uh, you know one of the last of the you know good old engineers good old boys would just get out there and get it done himself if he had to one of those hands-on mechanics that was always working on the race cars out there in the garage yep. working with his team and had a great plethora of drivers who came and raced for his team over the 27 years, 57 wins, and still leaving his legacy today with the sport, too, as having his son be a part of the Roush Yates engine program. They, yep. they filled all the Ford engines for all the Ford teams. So when you guys think of, of Robert Gates, is there any specific memories or anything you guys can think back of? Well, I just, like, just the, the stories of just the, the sheer will that he had, you know, the, the will to get it done, the will to succeed. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of, I know a lot of the, uh, the, the younger um, mechanics that have come along um, after him have, have built it in that way. Of course, you know, Roush, and I mean, you can't think about, you know, Ford without thinking about, you know, Roush, and of course, Yates had a lot to do with that. Um, and so, you know, I mean, my memories is just, I mean, he's almost as standalone, you know, memory. I mean, you know, how many um, motor builders can you think of, you know, off the top of your head? And Yates is, is definitely one of those. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely going to, definitely going to be lost. But, you know, it, it, it's amazing because they talk about there's so much arrow in the cars today, you know, that you know, the racing has gotten away from from racing because there's so much arrow. And, you know, I mean, they, he's a perfect example of uh, going out and just getting it done with just sheer horsepower. Sure. I think one of the fond memories 
memories I'm going to have of him, is, especially with his days as a team owner, and how, okay, he'd won his championship in 1999, and I started following the sport in the mid-2000s, really on a full-time basis, and mm -hmm. just watching that 88 car, that UPS Ford, Dale Jarrett just charged into the front, and in 2004 had knocked off so many top fives, didn't win a race, missed the playoffs. He missed the playoffs in 2005, but they go to Talladega. It's the October race, and it's Tony Stewart, Rusty Wallace, Ryan Newman. They're all battling for the championship. It's about three to four races in to the, what was called the chase for the next Hell Cup at the time. And so Stewart, Wallace, Newman, they're all leading laps at Talladega. The top three are just pulling themselves away. And here comes Dale Jarrett, right before the last caution of the race comes out. And he, he makes his way to the front. Caution comes out for Ken Schrader, smacking the wall. They do a green-white checkered restart. Dale Jarrett's able to hold off Tony Stewart, and he claims his final career win and what would be the final career win for Yates Racing. And wow. then Ricky Rudd running for that team in the early 2000s, coming back. I don't know if you guys remembered, but he retired for a year. And he filled in for Tony Stewart, comes back in 2007 in his first race back in the 88 car, taking over for Dale Jarrett, sits on the outside pole with teammate David Gilliland for the Daytona 500. So memories like that, those kind of comeback stories, because we knew Yates wasn't a top five team anymore at that point, or a top ten team, but still getting the, the work done at a super speedway, and then selling the, the team off to his son, it ran through 2009. But a lot of great memories. When you think Ford in this sport, you think Yates. Absolutely. I mean, I was little when, when all this was going on, but I mean, I always watched NASCAR with my, my family, my dad and my grandpa and my pop, but he was always a name that I can remember coming up like frequently. It was somebody that my dad liked. My dad's a mechanic, so he, he was very popular. I mean, I don't remember much, but when I was little, it was definitely, he was definitely popular. Yeah, and there was a team that was really just dominant through the 1990s, put up a good challenge with Hendrick Motorsports and Jeff Gordon and his dominance and Dale Earnhardt and Richard Childress Racing. Great. Those were the top three greats of the late 90s, early 2000s. Absolutely. So in other news, let's shift gears here to ESPN Albuquerque. So Dave, in the last month, you have been, and I saw this on Facebook, so I'm kind of stealing this, <laughs> but you've been to Bristol, Tennessee, known for the racetrack, right. Bristol, Connecticut, known for ESPN, but combined, those towns don't even mirror how much the size is here in Albuquerque. Yeah, it's um, it's amazing because uh, when I, when I turn the corner, because you know, of course, we have uh, um, Google Maps, you know, that can get us anywhere um, <laughs> to uh, the ESPN headquarters. Uh, I mean, I've yeah, been working uh, working for ESPN Radio and uh, Joe O'Neill for uh, for almost five years now, and of course, you know, I mean, I grew up, you know, knowing ESPN. Um, uh, 1979, ESPN got started um, as a uh, as a sports only 24 hours of sports on cable, and they thought going to be a disaster. Who's going to want to watch cable, you know, 24 hours a day? Look at it now. Something like nine channels, including um, streaming. They got special, you know, sports. I mean, the X Games, everything they've been involved in. And so to have an opportunity to actually go um, and tour the facility was absolutely amazing. Um, and it did not, uh, it, 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 it exceeded my expectations in all ways. The amount of copper cable that is in that building alone uh, is probably worth millions. Millions, um, and so we, we have wow. some some photos from uh, from the trip that we can uh, put up and kind of talk about it. But being able to sit on the set of uh, uh, money, yeah, you pull up and it, and it looks like that. You know, welcome welcome to Bristol, and then you go inside and you know all the way down to the it's a uh, classic the little, like little, little, LED lighting sign from the 1980s. Exactly, and, and look at that set there. I mean, you know, that, that's like college football. And so there's all kinds of different levels that you can go to, and different types of shots, um, different places that you can uh, you can get around to. But sitting on the set of, there it is, uh, I basically posted, hey, look out, Greeny, I'm ready to take over your spot. <laughs> so on the set of, uh, of Mike and Mike, uh, it was uh, just phenomenal. Of course, no, everybody could, couldn't have been nicer. Uh, Rosilla was actually recording a show live when I was uh, there yesterday. Um, but it, it, it's amazing. Sitting on the Monday Night Football um, set, you know, they were getting ready to break it down. Of course, the Chiefs, I mean, how, how all of a sudden you got like nine points with, you know, Less than a minute left in that game, um, of course. You know, because I'm, you know, I'm nail biting. I'm like looking at it on my uh, on my smartphone, trying to keep track of the scores when I was coming back. But uh, uh, it, it's it's a phenomenal facility. Uh, it's amazing.
amazing how they repurpose the sets because um, you go in there and it, it's basically like a football field inside um, and they move the sets and they got the little uh, markings on the floor of where they're, where they're going to move the different tables to um, and they repurpose um, all of the rooms that was on the original uh, set where, where they first got started which is now Baseball Tonight um, where the whole, the whole thing got started but you know to basically see the radio side um, as well as the TV side it's no wonder they're a worldwide leader in sports. Um, the amount of effort that they put into just in the roof, you know, with the uh, way, way to move all the cameras and everything is basically robotic. Um, we looked at uh, walls of screens and the producer basically is like, uh, you know, moving the orchestra, you know, because he's, you know, he's making calls and, and swiping screenshots. And I mean, it was, it was absolutely phenomenal um, to see what they're doing. 4,000 employees um, at ESPN, 18 buildings, basically um, the whole economics of the city, but got some of the best wings uh, at J. Timothy. You ever go to, you know, Bristol, Connecticut, go check out some wings. They get, get them <laughs> dirty, which means they, they refry them. So, I mean, it was it was, uh, it was was as much about eating um, as it was about going to ESPN. But Was that I, on the campus of ESPN? Uh, no, that wasn't on the campus. That was actually in town, but was able to, um, I've been interviewing Matt Willis, the stats and info guy, for over eight years. Tom McKeon, uh, my Formula One buddy that's actually now a producer on Mike and Mike, he's been a guest um, on my show for three years. We had never met. And so the opportunity to go up and see those guys um, and, and to see their passion. All of them are doing different things, but they're still passionate for motorsports. Um, when uh, when Matt Willis first got there, they were still doing NASCAR, NASCAR tonight. Um, ESPN and NASCAR still had a really tight relationship. Of course, a couple of years ago, that's when NASCAR decided not to, uh, um, uh, when ESPN decided not to uh, continue its relationship with NASCAR. Um, and so a lot of us, you know, are basically um, left on the sides. You know, motorsports continues to be that way to where, um, you know, uh, I mean, we've even fallen below hockey at this point. And, and all of the, you that are from the, you know, the Northeast, I didn't say anything negative about hockey, so don't say many um, hate mail. But uh, it was really neat to get to go and actually see what, what it really looks like. And, um, and if you think it's impressive, you know, watching on TV, if you ever get a chance to go and take a tour, you should, you should definitely do it because that is, that is worth uh, every penny of free. That's absolutely sure. Well, you have me curious. Is there any comparison to how big that campus is to, to maybe a property or campus here in Albuquerque? You know, the, the great question. Um, I would say that it's similar to CNM. Ooh, okay. um, it's not as big and as vast as, as UNM, uh, but but more CNM, uh, a couple of big uh, big buildings. I, I didn't get to go to the research, but I, I hear that you know there's just desks of people that are you know researching all kinds of. I mean, you know, Jay Ski you know was was bought um, and, uh, by ESPN. Of course, Racing Reference we talked about um, as well, and, and just groups of people trying to find out you know the craziest stats. What you know what's the most laps led to never have a top five finish? You know, I mean you know how you, I mean you probably stuff know. that we research. Yeah, 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 you would you would know that off the top of your head, um, but uh, but it, it it's pretty phenomenal. And yet, you know, I was just in mainly the production area, um, and of course they build their own sets. I mean, it's you know they got their own shops. I mean, they basically do everything in house so they can do it right and do it the way they want it. Let sure. me ask: Bristol, Connecticut, or Bristol, Tennessee? Ooh, good question. Well, uh, Bristol, uh, Tennessee. Yeah. Why? Good yeah. Answer. Well, I mean, having having run, you know, Sandy Motor Speedway, which is also a half mile, um, it's a little bit different. There's that. Well, I mean, that was another shot. We could come back to that one. But, um, uh, but yeah, ten Bristol, Tennessee. As a racer, um, you gotta you you gotta go. It's the world's fastest Amazing. half mile. You get you got a hundred thousand screaming fans, and the, and the population of the city is something like forty seven hundred. So where in the world do they all come from? You know, and I mean, they and they just come from nowhere. Uh, getting lucky enough to actually ride on the hauler parade um, into uh, Bristol was amazing because it's like there's thousands of people, thousands of people on the site. There's more people on the hauler parade than come to the state fair parade. 
So, I mean, it's pretty phenomenal. So I would have to say that, I mean, yeah, definitely uh, Bristol, Tennessee. No, no, no harm, no foul um, ESPN. But, uh, uh, but if you're a racing fan, you gotta, you got to go to Bristol, Tennessee. Did you get the chance to kind of mingle with anyone famous out there at ESPN? Uh, no, it's funny because uh, you, by the time I got there, I mean, all the, all the morning show guys um, were, were basically off and they were doing, you know, I mean, interviews on other shows. Um, there's always, you know, things going on. But, yeah, there, there wasn't an opportunity. Um, closest I got was to Ryan Rossillo, and that was on the other side of the glass. So, um, but were you no, like waiting for he could see you or anything? No, but I would say, and, and we can come back to that photograph he had just just a minute ago. Was able to uh, catch up actually with uh, um, Dale Earnhardt Jr. at uh, at Dover, and uh, and this is one of those this is one of those things where you had just texted me um, about 250th victory for Hendrick, and then you know I you know I basically. We got a hold of Dale, and I just asked him. I said, "Hey, there was a lot of potential milestones today, including, um, you know, being on the verge of, you know, 250 victories for Hendrick." And you know, I asked him. I said, "How much did it mean for the team to have the level of success that it had today, uh, to be on the brink of that?" And and one, he just kind of looked at me like, "How do you guys know these things?" You know, because yeah. you know, because you know, Dale didn't know that off the top of his head. And uh, but you know, I mean, a class act. Um, th this the sport is definitely going to miss him when he's gone. His answers are always, you know, uh, true to the heart. He always thinks about it. He doesn't give you, he doesn't give you a BF, BS answer. And, of course, um, he's got that Dale Earnhardt Jr. sense of humor. Because I asked him, I said, uh, how close is Chase? And he goes, one more position. You know, and I thought, what a, what a great answer. How are you going to come back? How are you going to come back from that? But, yeah, at, at Chase Elliott is on the verge. Um, there's a lot of conversation about whether we're going to have a, ever have another seven-time, eight-time winner. Um, it's going to have to be someone young. It's going to have to start with, with Chase Elliott or Kyle Larson or, or any of those those guys because in the modern era, it's so competitive. I, I can't imagine. If, if Jimmy Johnson somehow wins eight, and you better not count him out because you, you should see the look on his his face. You better not count him out. If he gets even close to a sniff, then um, he could win eight. And then if I was him, I would drop the mic and walk off right there. I mean, there's what else do you have to prove at that point? 100 wins. Well, he's only got 17 to do it. Well, okay. So if we're going to open a, a little a dialogue here, what's more impressive? Would it be eight championships or 200 victories? I think in this era, 200, because when Richard Petty did it, and this is nothing knocking the, the pre-modern era of the sport, they ran 50 races a year. And that was at a time where maybe five or six drivers could go out and win, and it was usually Richard Petty or David Pearson. Right. Now you're doing it at a time where there's not that much of a difference between the first place car and the 25th place car. That's I true. think it's a lot harder now. And there's less races. There's 36 races. There's a lot more corporate involved with this. There's a lot more publicity that comes with this as compared to where NASCAR was in the 1970s. So there's a a lot more internal and external pressure on these drivers. Well, I mean, it's a great segue. I wanted to talk a little bit about Formula One, um, and I'm going I'm to throw Josh off because he's probably getting ready with a little NHRA. Uh, but let's talk Formula One because effectively there there are six guys that can win. You know, I mean, there's not, I mean, they, they, start, <laughs> they start 20 guys, but there's six guys. There's, I mean, Lewis Hamilton, um, and you got Valtteri Bottas for Mercedes, uh, one and three in point. Sebastian Vettel uh, and Kimi Raikkonen, two and five in points. Max Verstappen, who got um, a great victory um, over the weekend, and, you know, some of that was because, you know, uh, we uh, had an early retirement for uh, Kimi Raikkonen, uh, didn't even start the race, actually. Um, but, see, there's a perfect example of Formula One. Uh, there's there's six guys that could potentially win. It's what um, NASCAR used to look like in the 70s. It, exactly, and and it's one of those things that what, what they say. Well, why why is it uninteresting? Why do people not follow Formula One? And it's it's one of those things. Plus, it's on at you know three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. But uh, that's a, definitely an example. But right now, you got a 34 point lead of uh, Lewis Hamilton over Sebastian Vettel. Um, he's probably not going to be able to make it up. And of course, you know, other than the video that I showed that they pulled down. So if you ever wanted to go back and see episode three. The reason that you can't see it is because Formula One took it down. Um, but uh, basically, I broke down why Sebastian Vettel just lost the championship trying to uh, win the race in turn one. Uh, Daniel Ricciardo, uh, strong run, finishing third again. You know, and so basically, it's Red Bull, Ferrari, and Mercedes. So I mean, there's you know, there's there's three. If you're not driving for one of those teams, you're probably not going to win. So that's probably one of those reasons why Formula One um, isn't as liked. But you're right. 
Now, we got to take a quick break, but there's going to be more here on the New Mexico Motorsports Report here on the ProView Networks. Stay with us. Duke City Sports Bar. Proud supporter of ProView Sports and New Mexico Youth Athletics. Catch all the sports action from high school, college, pros, and MMA on one of our 35 HD TVs. Start your night off right with any selection from our delicious menu prepared with fresh, never frozen ingredients. Duke City Sports Bar, Albuquerque's newest sports bar. Located on Eubank and Montgomery, dial 505-433-4020. Folks, there's no other way but to be all in. Either he's Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. And you can experience the real and authentic, true life change that only God can provide to humanity. See, when we truly encounter Jesus and purpose to know him and follow his teachings, hashtag life change will occur. And welcome back to the New Mexico Motorsports Report here on the ProView Networks. I'm Dominic Adagone. And I'm David Swope. And joining us uh, in the studio now is uh, Larry Pitsley. How are you doing today, Larry? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm glad you could come down. Uh, sorry it was on sh such short notice, but I figure any time we want to talk road racing that you would uh, you'd be available. I am always available to talk racing. Well, um, of course, president with uh, Southwest Motorsports um, and, uh, you know, kind of close to the New Mexico Motorsports Report. There's, uh, there's the logo, but but um, as a as a racer, what what kind of car do you drive? I drive a, a Porsche. Um, it's kind of a vintage modified type Porsche. It's a 1975 914. Wow! Um, but it's it's highly modified into a full blown race car with all 911 running gear and brakes and engine, etc. Um, pretty fast car. Um, looks good while it's going and. Uh, um, and we've had a lot of success with it over the years. Well, I was going to ask you: Did 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 you evolve the car as as you went along? I mean, because there's some some fairings and there's some some added fiberglass and stuff like that. When you kind of got started, with was it was it just a stock 914, and you, you did a, a lot of changes to it, or? Well, it started life as a, um, a 1975 914, um, and in 1985 it was taken off the street, and an organization in Dallas was going to build it into a race car. Well, they never quite finished it. Oh. So I bought it in 1972 and brought it to actually Lubbock, Texas, where we built it into a um, street legal autocross car. Okay. And we won everywhere we went, and so everybody thought we were cheating. And we had to explain that we weren't cheating. We had the rule book, etc. So finally, I just said, to heck with it. Let's just make it into a race car where everybody's cheating. And so you're, <laughs> you're, just, you're just part of the crowd then. And so that's what we did. And in 1993, we um, built it into a, uh, a full-blown race car. And we started going uh, Porsche Club uh, club racing. Well, talk a little bit about, before we talk about road racing, talk a little bit about autocross. I mean, what uh, what what that is? Well, autocrossing is, uh, uh, it's, it's, Basically, it's you're racing against time. You're on a course by yourself. The courses are a variety of things. I mean, I can remember doing a, a lot at the UNM parking lot down by the University Hospital. Um, you know, in a lot of places, um, we would go to airports and, and things of that nature where we could we could run, but there's cones set up and our courses designed and, and you race against time. And everybody races the same course against time. And the guy who does it in the shortest period of time is the winner. So how would you cheat at autocross? <laughs> yeah. Well, you tell them you have one kind of engine <laughs> you really have another. Um, there's a variety of things you can do. I mean, we at one time were, were running a, a older 911, and it was a, a 911T, which was the lowest horsepower Porsche. But what we did is we put S pistons and E cams from the other two variety, which pumped the horsepower up about 50 over what the stock was. And so we started beating a lot of people. But, I mean, that's just in one way. And you can't really tell that uh, because it's pretty much internal. Internal, yeah. Yeah, so you can't really tell. 
and uh, and so we did things like that. Um, we got special tires, and you know, I had to deal with Pirelli for a while, and they were sending me free tires, and and they were um, the Pirelli P0. I was the first guy to test the P0s way back when. when wow! And they were a bad tire. Wow! I told them they weren't a good autocross tire, so they quit sending them to me. Well, and uh, because I, I mean, I, I haven't. I must admit, I haven't done a lot of autocrossing. Um, I, I really love the door to door. I, I loved, you know, being out there with uh, someone else that is focused on the same uh, task, going the same direction, five point harness. I mean, to me, I think it's safer than it is, you know, driving on the street um, because everybody is, you know, kind of got the same purpose. Um, and, uh, and you know, of course, we we're always talking about, you know, cheating out there. But I'm thinking to myself with, with like vintage racing that you're involved in or even SCCA, it, it's not like there's, there's a lot of money to be made. So the the whole cheating thing, you know, is just kind of always makes me laugh. And because I mean, you you know, like you know, the Formula Ford guys, and you know, I mean, they're, they're always you know watching the rule book really close. Or if you go run with RMBR or anything like that, that they get a little uh, a little particular. But let's talk a little bit about Southwest Motorsports. We uh, we got some photos here of some various uh, cars to kind of show the different uh, the different vehicles that are there. This is uh, uh, looks like one of the the group races. Um, Tell me a little bit about that. Well, that's a, a start. That's um, the start at Sandia Speedway. You can see the the starter waving the flag there, coming down for the start. Um, and uh, the little orange car way in the back there. That's turn 14. Yep. And you come out of turn 14 as a group. You get the green flag and you race down into turn one. Um, which is several hundred yards down the road, and you get in into turn one in, in a pretty much of a big pack. And um, usually by the time you get to turn six or seven, it's strung out and, and it now becomes more where you can pass people. The starts are probably the, oh, if there's a danger factor involved, they're the most dangerous because you're all going into that first turn pretty much together, um, door to door. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes three and four wide? Yes. Unfortunately. And, and it's really, it's really built to be too wide, but there's been three and there's been four, and I've been on the outside where the being the fourth car and I ended up off the track right. because there's no room. Um, but that happens, um, you know, and you just uh, work your way back on the track and continue on. Um, you know, things like that do happen. Um, in our type of racing, we try not to bang into each other. Um, you know, we have rules that, that are against that because some of these cars, even though they're not worth a whole lot of money, they cost a lot to repair because they're old and it's hard to find parts and things yeah. like that. Um, my car is mostly fiberglass. So you can get all the fiberglass, but you know, like the nose on my car, which is the front fenders, the nose and um, is one piece. Well, it's about a $900 piece of fiberglass. Right. And then you have to get it, you have to fit it, then you have to paint it. And so you're into it for like $1,500. So if you run into somebody and break up the, f the fiberglass, you usually can't repair it. Sure. You know, because you've usually damaged it enough. So we try not to run into each other. Is that more like a policing amongst yourselves? Or yes. is that, okay. Yeah, there are rules. Um, I, I raced with the Porsche Club and did a lot of club racing and they have a rule it's called a 1313 so the first time you do some kind of a uh, have an encounter with another car you might get a um put on probation for 13 months. And if you have a second time within those 13 months, then you get what's called the second half of the 13 where you're suspended for 13 months. So you don't get to race with them. Um, so th those kind of rules keep you from running into each other. That doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, <laughs> but it, it does happen. Um, but th they do that because we don't, that's, there's no there's no money involved you know we're doing this for fun and so some of us have a bigger commitment financially than others but you still don't want to have to um, throw a lot of money to repair your car um, I've been doing this for a, a long long time I've actually been doing it um, probably when David was a little boy <laughs> and I and I knew his mom and dad real well in the Porsche Club so yeah um, you know so David was about this big then, and uh, they'd come to the racetrack, and and uh, so we've been doing it a long time around here. We never even really had a racetrack in Albuquerque. We didn't have really a road course, an official road course in New Mexico at the time. So we had to do a lot of traveling and running around the 
usually Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, but we ended up you know, getting Sandia Speedway in Albuquerque. We ended up getting, um, we ended up getting the, uh, the track down near Deming. Um, you know, so we've got a couple tracks here now. Um, they just built a, a really nice track over Wilcox, Arizona called Indy Motorsports uh, Ranch. Uh, they built another real nice one up in Denver called Highland, Highland Plains or Highland, yeah, high, high, high Plains. Yeah, High Plains. Yeah. High Plains Raceway, which is just phenomenal. And it's very fast. And we run close to 150 up there. Wow. And, um, and I'm not a fast, I'm not one of the faster guys. I mean, some of those other guys are pretty crazy, but yeah. uh, how fast they can go. But the, 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 the way this has all changed in, in the 25 years I've been doing this is, is incredible because we now have tracks that we can go to without having to travel. Um, when I first started traveling, uh, my close tracks were Denver, uh, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, uh, Topeka, Kansas, uh, Heartland Park, uh, um, Hallett, Oklahoma. And so we just ran all over the place and, and people said, well, you make any money doing that? And I go, no, <laughs> you know, it's for the fun of it. I mean, right. we do it because we really enjoy the, the cars and we enjoy the competition. Well, and we, we showed some uh, different cars during that clip. I mean, a open wheel car, there was a go-karts. I mean, you've got, you know, a really good uh, growing group of uh, junior carts and adult carts. Um, but, you know, street cars, like there's a Mini Cooper in that shot there too, where people could come out and actually um, take their car on the track and actually go through a school. Uh, talk just to briefly a little bit about the high performance school that uh, Southwest Motorsports puts together. We've always had a, a, a driving school where we train people that want to either learn how to race cars or just to be better drivers. Mm -hmm. And um, no matter who you are, if you take the course, you'll be a better driver. Um, and it's a, it's a two day deal where the first day you're with a, a, an instructor and you have a manual and you're on the track and you're in the classroom, on the track, in the classroom, critiquing all the way through the next day you're out on a track by yourself with other people um, all in a, a pretty organized safe we, we dictate where you can pass you can't just go willy-nilly crashing into people um, and we do that so that you get a chance to improve your driving skills by yourself Guaranteed, you'll become a better driver on the street by going through our two-day class. And where can people find information to, to be a part of the class? Well, we, we're in the process, actually, of redoing our website. Um, it's swms.org, and they can go there. We have all the, all the forms. Um, the, the information about the class is on there. Uh, contacts for, um, if you want to call somebody, my name and number is up there. You can call me, and I'll help you through the process, along with our registrar and several other people. People. Yeah, um, and uh, if you get a chance to do that, I mean, it, it's great. There's, a, you know, even a, a licensing program you can go through uh, to where you could take a competitive license and, and go race at other tracks. And it is great to be able to sleep in your own bed, go out and learn how to do it. Um, and then w when you want to grow, there is some great regional racing, great opportunities. Hey, uh, Larry, really appreciate you coming in and, uh, and sharing with our uh, our TV audience now uh, a little bit about your wisdom with road, road racing. Well, I appreciate you having me down, and it gives me the opportunity to maybe encourage other people to come out and, and enjoy our sport. Um, we are having a race um, October 14th and 15th at Sandia Speedway, um, so people can come out and, and watch and see what we do and wander through the pits and talk to us and look at our cars. Yeah, and you can check out that at racesandia.com. A whole lot more coming up here on the New Mexico Motorsports Report. Stay with us. When I train for American Ninja Warrior, I schedule regular workouts to stay in shape. To keep my car in Ninja Tough shape, I head to a Napa Auto Care Center for regular maintenance and genuine Napa Auto Parts. Like brakes and batteries. I trust my Napa Auto Care Center for quality parts and quality service. And with the 24 month, 24,000 mile nationwide warranty, I drive away with peace of mind every time. Visit AutoCareNM.com to find a location near you. Dave & Buster's is your destination for fun. Eat delicious chef-crafted food. Try sizzling favorites and new creations from our talented chefs. Drink the coolest cocktail creations. 
Play the hottest new games to win awesome prizes. And watch all the games in the best sports bar ever. Only at Dave & Buster's. Garden Sorts Team Sales is a proud supporter of ProView Sports Network. Get into the game. Garden Schwartz Team Sales features fine products and apparel from Wilson, Shutt Sports, Speedline, and Russell Athletics. We offer custom embroidery and screen printing services for all of your school or club needs, from team uniforms to school letter jackets. Specializing in all sports and serving all communities, from big schools to small schools, from up north to down south, or all points in between, Garden Schwartz Team Sales, for great prices, friendly staff, and quality products, call Garden Schwartz Team Sales today at one 800 880-7767. That's 1-800-880-7767. Since 1939, Garden Schwartz Team Sales is a proud supporter of New Mexico Youth Athletics. And welcome back to the New Mexico Motorsports Report here on the ProView Networks. Time for a check of local racing action this weekend. Here's Brooklyn Green. All right, guys, this weekend we've got two things going on. We've got Sandia Speedway. We've got the Modified Madness. That starts at 3.30 p.m. And they'll be racing on the Clay Oval. And then at ABQ Dragway, we've got the Street to Strip this Saturday. It's street legal drags, test and tune, and time trials. So make sure you go out and support your local drivers. A lot of great racing this weekend. and. Also, some other racing we didn't get to touch on yet, the NHRA. Yeah, we're going to talk a little NHRA um, on the show. And uh, uh, this weekend, uh, we had uh, Steve Torrance got another uh, victory with a 3.684 pass at 329.34 in his uh, Capo uh, Racing uh, Top Fuel Dragster. Ron Caps also had a victory with a 3.879 pass at 331.53 in his uh, Napa Dodge Charger. RT. That is a career best eighth victory for the season and 58th of his career. Um, in pro stock, uh, uh, Greg Anderson uh, drove to victory the 6.571 at 201.73 um, in the Chevy Camaro. And then this blows my mind in this pro stock motorcycles. Uh, Tonglet had a victory, had a pass of 6.792 and 197.91 in his Suzuki. I mean, that's two wheels guys that's absolutely insane that is impressive. Uh, but uh, I want to thank ABQ Dragway and Yearwood for uh, that NHRA update uh, we got a lot of lot of neat things going on uh, local races one thing I did want to talk about real quickly with ABQ Dragway is coming up on Saturday the 14th is probably one of my favorite events out there at all and it's called the Hot Rod Rumble it's a combination of car show and pre 73 cars so if you haven't had a chance to go check that out you definitely want to check Check that out, but uh, chances we'll see a 67 Stingray out there. Chances are, <laughs> split window, 60, 63 split window. 63, I, yeah, there we go, yeah, yeah, 63 split window. Talking about Corvette, is it, that you know, you kind of threw me off there for, but for some reason. I was thinking about uh, um, Mustangs when you okay. said that, but yeah, 63 split window, um, awesome car. That's actually where I first fell in love with uh, racing. My dad uh, had a B production 63 split window, uh, uh, candy apple red. Oh, nice color. Yep. That's a nice touch. Yep. Well, and some other headlines we're following this weekend, the NASCAR Truck Series points. They're off this weekend, but they have the elimination race at Talladega. Let's take a look at where the drivers stand heading into that elimination race. Only two drivers safe at this point. Yeah, Christopher Bell, uh, you know, solidly in front there. Ben Rhodes uh, coming off that victory uh, sure uh, has made, uh, separated themselves from the field. Uh, John Hunter Nemechek, uh, Kaz Grala, and Austin Sindrick, uh, you know, holding on there. Uh, it would take take some real problems with uh, with Matt Crafton and Johnny Sauter for them not to final out uh, the uh, final four going into that, that final race. And then we also have an elimination race this upcoming week, and you will be there out at the Charlotte NASCAR Xfinity Series race. NASCAR Xfinity points, nobody is safe at this point. Justin Allgaier and William Byron definitely have, I would think, a commanding lead over the top eight, that ninth place cutoff. Brandon gone about two points out, but anything can happen in the Xfinity race out there in Charlotte. And gone has been known to, to go out and take a few stage points, <laughs> even a stage win out of Kentucky earlier this year. So not sure who do you guys think's going to be on the outside after this thing's over. 
Well, I think Brendan Gaughan is definitely going to use the uh, chrome horn, I think, as they refer to it. Um, he would definitely move somebody out of the way uh, to continue. But I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's anybody's game at this point. Um, it would be nice to see uh, Al Geyer or one of the regulars, William Byron, somebody actually um, uh, get a victory um, and move forward on that. But uh, definitely, definitely going to be uh, worth tuning in. Uh, Ryan Reed has some of the worst luck out there. So um, him being on the cutoff like that, I think Brandon Gaughan probably makes it. And I have, I have no doubt that something will probably happen to Ryan Reed. And, you know, I'm not jinxing him, so uh, just don't get mad at me um, over that one. But, uh, but I think that, you know, you're, it's pretty solid. I think it's going to be a JR Motorsports battle down to the end. I think the one thing that shocks me is Blake Cook. Here's a driver who was just a few yep. points away from making the final four last year, and he's sitting on the outside. I think we kind of, all three of us might have been safe to assume Jeremy Clemens was not going to advance to the next yep. round. Definitely that great win out at the road course, but they just don't have the, the horsepower to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's a great Cinderella story, and as we talked about Robert Yates earlier, I mean, his dad building the motors, I mean, it'd be a, a great story, but it's, it's really hard to compete against that Hendrick Power and the relationship with JR Motorsports. Sure. And the other thing with points, too, NASCAR Cup Series, NASCAR Monster Energy Series. Field is reset. We just have 12 drivers now left in the battle for the championship, and the inaugural season monster has been sponsoring this series. And when I look up at that board, there are three drivers, and I thought we would have seen at least one or two of the winless drivers not advance. We have three guys, Jamie McMurray, Chase Elliott, and Matt Kenseth, who all have decent point totals. They have not yet won this season, but... They're, they're showing that, hey, even though we don't have a win, we can go up there and, and still challenge for top five finishes and points and stage points. Well, absolutely. Seeing how all our uh, fuel strategy winners are already out because they were eliminated in the first round, I think it's going to be very interesting. Jamie McMurray, um, I, you know, I like him. I enjoy following him, but he's, he's probably um, not going to make it. Uh, if something was to happen, like what happened with Harvick, he gets himself a couple of laps down. I mean, it's hard to say that, you know, that Harvick might not in, advance to the round of eight. Uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., he goes out and gets a victory. He's definitely going to knock somebody deserving out of there. Probably one of the most surprising has been the inconsist inconsistency of Matt Kenseth. You know, I mean, he has great runs. He doesn't have great runs. But he's got to get a victory. I mean, at some point he's got to get a victory because I'm sitting here thinking the whole reason they came up with the chase to begin with, 2003, right? Um, you know, when he wins the points championship without a victory. Could he play spoiler again. Sure. And the one I look at, you brought him up, Jamie McMurray. He has mm -hmm. seven career wins and actually had one of our staffers bring up this stat earlier in this week to me. Of his seven wins, five of those victories have come at either tracks in the playoffs or tracks that get visited twice a year that are in the playoffs. And we have those coming up. Being Talladega, a three-time winner, and at Charlotte, a two-time winner. McMurray has shown to have the speed, but just not quite like Kyle Larson. Well, and you got to wonder sometimes, is that that killer instinct? You know, I mean, getting done what he's got to be done. I, I watched Kyle Larson at uh, at Eldora just destroy a truck trying to win. That, right I mean, that course, wall. That was, that was when I became, you know, his biggest fan. And I know we're not supposed to, you know, pick favorites or anything like that. But but Kyle Larson will drive you in the wall to win. Sure. Um, we know that, you know, Kyle Busch uh, will as well. Jimmy Johnson, I'm not sure if, if he'll put you in the, in, in the wall or not. But I was thinking about this. What if it came down to the final race and Chase Elliott was leading and Kyle Busch, will Kyle Busch Pass him on the spin outside him? Two to go. Will Kyle Busch <laughs> put him in the wall? Would, would he put him in the wall? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Larry's off camera nodding like there's no nobody's tomorrow. And, you know, what, what was Jimmy Johnson? Jimmy Johnson on the verge of, of winning an eighth championship. Kyle spin him? Of course he will. We're going to have to wait and see what happens with that. But it's time for some fan mail, guys. Excellent. And we, we've been getting some fan mail here at the New Mexico Motorsports Board. And actually, our first piece of mail went to Brooklyn. So why don't you go ahead and open that up and let's see what, 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 what the fan What kind of fan? I, I mean, Brooklyn's the only one with fans. And actually, actually, there's a note in there. Why don't you go ahead and read the Aww. note? There's a note attached to that. I'm curious what that note says. Dear Brooklyn, I'm so sorry I got eliminated from the playoffs. I know it can be tough rooting for a driver in the... T <laughs> I'm not reading It goes that. on to say in the twilight <laughs> of their career. Please accept this gift, a die-cast replica of what will be my final career win from Phoenix for being a lifelong fan. Signed, Ryan Newman. What? Show that to the Did camera. Did you guys Ryan Newman shirts in Charlotte? <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, there, there's the Granger car. He won in a fuel mileage race. We always give Brooklyn a lot of crap for being a Newman <laughs> fan. But 
Yeah, that's the car he won without a Phoenix in March. Thanks, guys. You know, the, the respect I, I have for Brooklyn, though, is is you, you're staying with it. <laughs> you know, you're not a, you're not a fair weather fan. You know, all of a sudden, hey, I, I'm a Kyle Busch fan because you know because he's winning, or you know, I'm you know I, I'm a Martin Truex fan. I mean, think of all the bandwagoners that are Martin Truex fans, right? I mean, Martin Truex, what a what a fantastic story being from the Southwest. You know, uh, Denver, small team, Cole Pern. I mean, Cole Pern's one of those guys that he he's going to outwork you. You know, and and it's it's amazing what that team um, has been able to uh, been able to accomplish. So uh, you have tons of respect for you being a fan, and we get we we, we give you a hard time, uh, but it's uh, but it's, we tease uh, because we care. It's only because we care. <laughs> but I don't know if if you're like me. I like a good sale, and anything that's on sale is great. And I'll guarantee it's that the Ryan Newman shirts are going to be on sale at Charlotte. It's going to be on clearance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe I'll get you a combo then. There we go. Thank you. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the New Mexico Motorsports Report for Brooklyn Green and David Soap. I'm Dominic Aragon. Check us out on nmmotorsportsreport.com and like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. We'll see you next time.